Hey, it's George from DinosaurGeorge.com. If you've got a question that has to do to, with anything to do with paleontology, uh, write to me at DinosaurGeorge.com. Click on the Ask Dinosaur George page, submit your question, and I'll do my best to answer it. Keep in mind that we receive about a thousand questions a week, and it is impossible to answer them all. So we do our best. So if you write to me and I don't respond, just keep trying. That's the only suggestion I can give you. Also, if you make your questions kind of short and to the point, it certainly makes it more likely that your questions will be forwarded to me. All right, let's get into it. This first question comes from Ryan from Beret, Ohio. He says, hi, Dinosaur George. Hey, Ryan. He says, I have a strange question. Is it possible that some dinosaurs had hair? I'm asking because some dinosaurs had feathers, and you said that dinos were more, most like warm-blooded and lived in cold areas. So is it possible they had hair? You know, Ryan, that's a great question. Um, one of the things about some of the feather impressions that are being found in some of the fossilized feathers, they resemble hair very, I mean, they're very, very similar to hair already. And hair and feathers are basically made of the same components, which is keratin. Um, certainly it's possible. The biggest problem is that when a dinosaur or any animal dies, its body begins to decompose and feather, hair, and skin and soft tissue is usually the first stuff that goes away. So it is probably, it's possible. I don't know if they did or not, um, but it's certainly possible. That's a tough question because there's just no evidence to support it. But I can say, I, I'll say this, since the animals have feathers, uh, certainly it's possible that they would have had hair. All right, my buddy Wes from Floresville, Texas. Wes is a very good friend of mine. He says, howdy, George, long time no see. Yeah, Wes, I guess the last time I saw you was when we were working together in my exhibit. I guess that's the last time. He says, I have a question about the recent proposed relationship between Taurosaurus and Triceratops. What is your opinion of the idea that Triceratops was actually a juvenile form or young adult Taurosaurus? Um, I, I gotta tell you something, I, Wes, I just completely disagree with that. It's frustrating to me that we go overboard so many times in this science where something is proposed that, that um, uh, is sometimes just out of the norm and that seems to get a lot of attention. And to me, it's almost like that encourages more people to continue to look for these odd um, announcements. Now, I'm not saying that's the case with this, but I'm just saying that's the feeling that I'm getting. The more spectacular and glamorous it is, the more likely you get press coverage. And we all know in this industry that press coverage equals recognition, and recognition makes it easier to ask for money to continue research. So, um, I think that the concept that they're the same di dinosaur just has no credibility whatsoever. That's just my opinion. I don't agree with it at all. Although it's true that these two dinosaurs have a lot of similarities, well listen, there's a lot of similarities between a Holstein and a Hereford cow, but they're two distinctively different species. But skeletal-wise, they look very, very similar. So I guess you could propose they're the same animal. It's just a Holstein grows up to become a Hereford. Well, that's just completely absurd. Uh, and I feel the same way about this. A lot of this is based on the fact that they've never found a young or small Taurosaurus. Well, that doesn't mean that it's because it, it looked like something different and morphed into Taurosaurus. It could simply mean they've never found one. What if Taurosaurus was more of an upland ceratopsian? What if it preferred environments that were not conducive to being fossilized? That's like saying that uh, there's not a lot of bighorn sheep in the fossil record, so therefore a bighorn sheep, when it was born, was actually a kangaroo, and then it changed into a bighorn sheep. <laughs> well, you can't, you can't make that leap of analogy. The reason why there's not a lot of bighorn sheep in the fossil record is because those animals prefer a mountainous region, and that's just not a good place to become fossilized. So this notion that it morphed into a different dinosaur at the end of its life to me makes no sense. All right, Ryan, and I gotta tell you guys something about Wes. Wes has the uh, um, a tattoo of Stan the Tyrannosaurus Rex on his arm. It is probably the coolest tattoo I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> All right, Ryan from Nottingham, England says, Hey George, hope you're having a good day. I am Ryan, I hope you are too. I wanted to ask, when the remains of the young Tyrannosaurus was found, it was really exciting news for me. But when will the public be able to see this Tyrannosaurus, which I think has been given the name Tinker? Hope to hear from you soon. Uh, Ryan, thanks for writing to me. Let me tell you the status of Tinker. I was just in uh, Washington, D.C., meeting with uh, National Geographic. We discussed 
tinker. Uh, I'm kind of waiting to find out if a television network is indeed interested in doing a story about it. And if they are, then we'll make a, an, an announcement to announce uh, its discovery and what it's all about. Um, if I don't find a network interested in it, then relatively soon I plan on making a big public announcement about it. It's a spectacular discovery. For those of you that don't know, this is the remains of the world's first juvenile Tyrannosaurus Rex. His nickname is Tinker. Its skeleton was tied up in the court system for about 12 years. So now it's gone through the court system and the man that owns it, uh, legally owns it now, it's all been, uh, um, all been determined that it was legally collected and it should belong to him and it does. So now we're to the point where we're getting ready to go out and uh, announce its discovery. So it should be soon, Ryan. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, Christian, uh, Christian from, I think this is Laufen, Germany. He says, hello, Mr. Blasing, your series on TV and... Uh, on YouTube are so interesting and I wish you furthermore uh, much success. Christian, thank you very much, man. That's very polite of you. Thank you. And please call me George or Dinosaur George. Uh, I appreciate your courtesy, but feel free to do that. All right. This question is, why did Tyrannosaurus or other theropods like Albertosaurus um, hunt the really well-defended herbivores like Triceratops or Ankylosaurus. They probably got injured uh, in, in these contentious fights to survive. Well, you're right, Christian. I'll tell you something. I believe that uh, dinosaurs, predatory dinosaurs, were very cautious about who or what they hunted. I think duckbills were the number one priority because they didn't have the weaponry to defend themselves. Certainly these dinosaurs did hunt and feed on ceratopsians and the ankylosaurs, but I will bet you, my friend, that they were incredibly cautious and the only way they would attack something like that would be if they had uh, other members of the family helping them hunt. Otherwise, I don't believe they would take on something as well defended as a ceratopsian or an ankylosaur by themselves. But that's a great question. Finally, uh, Baskar from Delhi, India. Baskar, nice to hear from you, my friend. He says, hello, Dinosaur George. I love your work and I wish to meet you someday and acquire all the knowledge from you. That's very kind of you. You know, I'd love to come to India. I'd love the opportunity to get to meet you uh, and, and all of my friends from India. I would love to go there. So thank you very much for your kind words. He says, here's my question. Do you think if we knew about the colors of all dinosaurs, we would be able to predict their behaviors better? And are there any way, or is there any way we would be able to figure out about their colors and their natural behavior? Uh, thank you. Love the way you encourage people to read and behave. Great respects for, for you. Uh, that is incredibly respectful. That's very polite of you, and I appreciate that very much, Pascal. I'm, I'm honored. Um, I, I do hope kids read, and I do hope everybody uses good manners. Uh, so thank you. That's very kind of you. Okay. Would we be, if determining the color, would color give us some insight into behavior? Absolutely it would, and that is a brilliant question. That's a brilliant question, man. You see, if we discovered that dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex were striped or spotted, that would add that much more credibility that they could utilize ambush as a way to hunt because they're using their camouflage to break up their, their silhouettes. If we found that those dinosaurs were just a mundane gray or brown or green or tan, it might suggest that maybe they weren't as active predators as we assume. So yeah, color is important. I will tell you this, that at the University of Texas in Austin, they have been able to chart the color of a dinosaur. They actually were able to look at the fossilized feathers of a dinosaur, and within those feathers there was something called melanosomes, which is basically the pigment that determines color. And they found that, the, that this one particular dinosaur, they were able to chart its colors. If I remember correctly, the dinosaur was black with gray stripes on its wings and a red head. That's kind of cool. That doesn't really give us insight. Those color patterns don't necessarily give us insight into behavior. But it's certainly possible that we can figure out a way to determine the actual color of a dinosaur. And when that happens, I do think it's going to change the way we look at some of them anyway. All right, that's it for now. If you've got a question, go to my website, dinosaurgeorge.com. While you're there, follow me on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, for anybody that's been asking questions and I haven't answered, please remember, we just get a lot and I'm doing my best. Until next time, everybody, for you young people, practice your reading. Becoming a good reader is very important. And for everybody, use good manners because it truly does make the world a whole lot nicer place to live than living with a bunch of grumpy old people. All right, I'll talk to you guys soon. Take care.